right, what is up, everybody? Happy Wednesday to you. Hope you guys are having a great day, a great week. Uh, welcome to Midnight Hatter Live, the weekly variety show where we talk about Gundam gaming and all kinds of good stuff. I am, of course, Stephen Midnight Hatter, your host, and joining me as always is the uh, Star Wars fan, Adam Blue. How are you doing, my bud? Hey, doing good. Yeah, Star Wars fan. You know, I was thinking about that today, um, how I don't keep up with it, but I still do, and I could still have conversations. And they're still passionate. I was thinking about that. Yeah, you know, we we just uh, I, I make the joke, of course, because I recently uh, tagged you in a uh, Star Wars thread on Twitter. And I was like, you know what? I think that Adam would appreciate the opportunity to talk Star Wars on YouTube with someone besides me who is just a <laughs> curmudgeon about everything. Um, no, that's. I hope so. yeah, but no, that's... Um, yeah. Yeah, good one. Uh, Hey, sorry if my voice is a little hoarse. I'm still a little bit sick. Um, if you guys caught the video on Monday over on uh, Talos Mobius's channel, Lord oh, Talos, yeah. USS Talos, whatever you know him by, uh, I was all also sounding a little bit hoarse, but I really appreciated the deep dive into the Zeta Gundam, the titular mobile suit of mobile suit Zeta Gundam, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, we, we had a great conversation. It was yeah. so much fun and it kind of inspired today's topic because i've been digging into a lot of like production notes and stuff like that and um the interview that you and i are going to be looking at today is actually from a website that you shared with me adam um oh I, yeah yeah i put a link down in the description um if you guys haven't read it it's on ultimatemark.com it's from sort of a gundam unofficial blog with some translations of some famous interviews this is going to be a fun conversation because you know, as I was reading through this interview, I was thinking to myself, man, this is like some stuff that, you know, we argue about on the internet all the time when it comes to Tomino and Gundam. And I think it's nice that we kind of have some solidified answers. I even yeah. joked with uh, Talos because I logged into the Bard Google AI. Are you familiar with that one, yeah. Adam? Yeah. Yeah. I uh I asked it to role play with me and I was like, okay, I want you to role play as the Gundam director and writer uh, Yoshiyuki Tamino and I'm going to ask you a series of interview questions. You know, please source whatever data you need to from the internet in order to answer these questions. And it was fascinating because you know, obviously in its learning language model voice it's like oh yes i'm yoshiyuki tamino i am excited to answer your questions please let me know what you want to talk about whether it's mobile suit gundam or mobile suit zeta gundam and so i asked it several questions and it would give me an answer and then it would cite like you know in in a 2009 interview i said this about you know the moral ambiguity between the federation and zeon during the one-year war and all this stuff i was like that's pretty cool yeah. <laughs> um, but even the AI didn't get some of these uh, yeah. interview questions from this um, interview that we're going to kind of read through together here today. So I'm excited to share it with you guys. Um, but yeah, if you guys haven't checked it out, speaking of, you know, Gundam lore, Adam dropped a video this morning on the uh, Operation Odessa, yep. which uh, I haven't gotten a chance to check it out yet, but um, I hope you guys have. If not, you know, we can all watch it together after the stream. Um, <laughs> Yeah, that was fun to do. And shout out to Talos. Again, another Talos shout out. He as helped as me always, with he, he's he knows his stuff. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, what's up, everybody in chat? We've got King Dylan. We've got Robert. We've got Skidiot. We've got Johnny Tacoma, Zionic Shadow. Good to see you guys hey. all hanging out with us this afternoon. And yeah, um, yeah hopefully we'll, we'll learn some fun things together. Um, am I missing anything? I feel like I'm forgetting some announcements. I did. Um, so I, as you guys know, I've been working on that Neo Zeon uh, bound oh, yeah. provided by the generous uh, Zeonic Shadow. Uh, I have made more mistakes in painting and detailing this kit than I probably have on any of my previous kits. And, and I don't know what it is. Maybe it's the conversation with Dirty Diggler. Maybe it's been just a renaissance of gumpla confidence. But I don't freak out the way I used to. I'm just like, uh. oh, you know what? I know how I'm going to fix this. This is fine. We're going to. No, you're right. That was a good conversation with Diggs because, it, it, you know, it, I talked about it before. Like, I like to talk to other people, especially with experience. And so when they can kind of say things that sound like truths that you can kind of use yourself. Yeah. Um, I think that kind of helps. Um, yeah. Because even 
it, but at the same time, what you're doing with the bound dock is very intentional customization where I think more often than not, you're going to be like, ah, that's not exactly what I wanted or envision. You know, I think it's harder when you're doing that. <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, and, and I'm going to address this. I'm actually recording all of these kind of micro steps and I'm going to put out a full oh. video. Um, hopefully it should be done uh, by the end of the week. But uh, yeah, you know, I'm going to address some of these things and I'm going to, I'm actually going to show off like, Hey, here's where I screwed up this. And like, maybe I could have taken the easy way out and said like, Oh, that's battle damage. And I'm just going to weather this and make it look uh. like it's, but you guys know me, that's not really my style. So, yeah. <laughs> um, you know, I, I hopefully will uh, show off some techniques that you can use to cover up your mistakes and rectify issues. I mean, oh man, I botched this one bad. So <laughs> really? No, I mean, it wasn't terrible. We so. won't see it at the end result, but I guess yeah. in your video, you'll kind of explain. Oh, yeah. I'm going to show you, um, okay. you know, where I had my thumbprint in the paint and, you know, oh, yeah, <laughs> it was. That's funny. Um, But yeah, what have you been up to uh, Gumpla wise? Have you done any builds recently or you've been kind of. Well, I'm working on uh, Zionic Shadows kit that he sent me, the uh, Red Rider. I mm. hope to have that done soon. I'm wanting in the next couple weeks for that to be my video. Uh, that's the plan here really soon. Um, and along with that, and then I think right after that, I'll probably get into then Goose's kit that he sent. But Indeed. Other than that, um, yeah, when it comes to Gumpla, that's just been about it, really. Um yeah. And, and and I was just reminded looking at my backlog, like we talked about the gap plant last week, and then it's like, man, I I got more to get to. But to be honest, I have enough stuff to keep myself busy. Uh, there so, you go. yeah. And, and sometimes it's like you like you were saying earlier is it's kind of better to be a little bit more intentional and deliberate about the kits that you build as opposed to just like I'm gonna snap build this, I'm gonna snap build this, I'm gonna snap build this. Yeah, like, you know, because you could just do that forever. And then have a right. pile and be like, what am I doing with this? <laughs> exactly. Um, so, yeah, I think that should be fun. Excuse me. <coughs> oh. Uh, oh. It's that time. Look, it's that time of year, man. Like, it if is. it's not allergies, it turns into a sinus infection. Uh, I think that's where I'm headed. Yeah. Um, but, yeah, thank you to my shout out to my daughter for bringing home the latest and greatest germs <laughs> from uh, from daycare. <laughs> but, uh yeah, let's hop into this screen share view so that I can start sharing with you this interview that we are looking at here today. <clears throat> yeah, this was a good one. Thanks for sharing this with me. Oh, well, thank you for sharing the website with me. Oh, <laughs> kind of funny how that goes around. But it even says the Z Gundam Memorial box. Now, is this related to the box set you have? No, this is a different one. Oh, okay. Oh, oh man. I'm just... Oh, yeah, sure. Yeah, you go do that. Um, get done what you need to, you don't, yeah. Oh, I wish I could pat you on the back and be like, it's okay, it's okay. <laughs> Oof, yeah, that's rough. Yeah, antibiotics is what I need. Yeah. Um. So yeah, this is a different memorial box. This one came out in 1994. Ah, And what's okay. interesting about this interview is that uh, it is actually conducted by a fellow anime director, uh, Hideaki, Hideaki, Ano, who you yeah, might know as that. that guy that's like a cheap ripoff of uh, Tamino. Well, no. the, interesting no, guy because I had heard of him, right? But the yeah. first works of his that I ever actually watched was Shin Godzilla, which is one of my favorite Godzilla movies. And then later I find out this guy did uh, Evangelion, yeah, which and is huge. Full disclosure, I never finished Evangelion. It just wasn't Same for here. me. Same here. <laughs> so, yeah, you know. Um, but know. He's, he started with Gunbuster, which is something right. I discovered recently, and I think it's amazing. Like, mm -hmm. Gunbuster sits up there with Gundam for me. Like, great story, great characters, sci-fi. Um, and then, yeah, when I first started watching Eva, I got to tell you, I was falling asleep. <laughs> I, I, that seems bad. I might have to get to it later and need a different mindset, but that doesn't take away from this guy being like an awesome artist, like the stuff he's created through the years and the fact that now he makes Shin Godzilla and the Shin like Kamen Rider, Shin um, Ultraman, 
uh, even though I don't think he directed that one, he wrote it. So we're talking about a top tier artist. Yeah, very speaking influential. Speaking to another top tier artist. So exactly. So, so I mean, bearing that in mind, obviously, you know, he's gonna know kind of what questions to ask and like how to kind of dig deep uh, into some of the motivations that uh, that Tamino had in writing and creating Zeta Gundam. So, um, just a moment. So, uh, one of the first things that I, I really want to draw people's attention to is because this is one of those mysteries that has been, you know, plaguing the internet for decades, right? Started off as kind of like a Reddit rumor, right? You know, the, uh, oh. the infamous <laughs> Camille autism, uh, yeah. meme, right? So even when I was interviewing the AI Tamino, um, you know, uh, AI Tamino said, oh, well, I've never commented publicly about, you know, Camille being an autistic character. But if I did, I would have represented him in a sensitive and, you know, uh, appropriate way. And so I think it's interesting that even in the translator's notes, he comments on Tamino uh, speaking about Camille being an autistic character. And we're going to get to that question here later on. Uh, interesting that he shouts out the Mobile Suit Breakdown podcast. <clears throat> oh, yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, and actually, surprisingly, I don't think, because you, you were just mentioning this, Anno, um, it doesn't mention Evangelion in his um, in his. I wonder if this was right before he yeah. made it. This is right before he made it, yeah. Which is interesting because he was still probably known in circles, you know, of like this is a good creator of story. Oh, yeah. But Eva was probably that next step for him. Yeah, put him, yeah. put him on the map. Yeah, for sure. So the first question that comes up is, um, you know, kind of, you know, he says at the time I was enthralled by the woman who became the model for Camille. And um, yeah. Anno kind of gets into a leading question here about um, heavy metal Elgheim, which uh, is infamously one of Tamino's less popular work. I, I thought it was fun, you know, but um, but it was actually during Elgheim that uh, Tamino was working with the Mecha designer uh, Nagano, who designed the Mecha for Elgheim, and he designed the original sketches that became the Zeta Gundam. Uh, well, actually, technically, they became the Hyakushiki. So that was oh, the, yeah. you know, when he asked him to to draw him the Zeta Gundam, uh, it actually looks a lot like the the the, the mech from Elgheim, which I think is funny. Um, and and then yeah, it became the Hyakushiki. Oh yeah, but uh, Ano actually gets into a sort of leading question about Camille being inspired by a real life sculptor, Camille Claudel. Now, I don't know much about sculptors. Um, I, I guess I'm familiar with Rodin um, and, you know, the thinker. But for me, I was kind of reminded of, you know, being a literary person. Uh, I was reminded of the story of, like, Mary Shelley, who she was married to a uh, popular writer at the time, Percy Shelley, famous poet. And it has been long theoried, similar to the story of Camille Claudel, it's been long theoried that Mary Shelley, who grew up, family owned a library, she was very well read, she went to school. Percy Shelley never went to university, never studied writing, never never a famous reader, right? Uh, it has been long rumored that maybe Mary Shelley actually wrote all of Percy Shelley's poetry. Mm. Because then, you know, she goes on to write Frankenstein, and obviously that's a bigger hit than any of his poetry was while he was alive. So similarly, you have a relationship between Camille Claudel, who was a, um, who was an understudy of Rodin. And uh, even here, Tomino is kind of suggesting like, yeah, you know, Camille Claudel possibly sculpted some things that, uh, that Rodin took credit for. And I think on the Wikipedia, they've confirmed that a lot of her works were, Rodan took credit for. So interestingly, 
Tomino's uh, <laughs> inspiration with with Camille, with uh, Camille Claudel is not even not not just her name, but also suggesting that the character Camille Badan almost kind of has his credit taken away from him by the Zeta Gundam itself. Like the Zeta Gundam becomes oh yeah the character of the story. What did you think about that, and how do you kind of? Yeah, this I th- this was an excellent uh, interview overall. Like I felt like oh. this really went deep into creators' thoughts that sometimes we don't get insight into, especially when he was talking about the relationship between a main character and whatever it could be, like um, and how that sometimes an artist m- might be compelled or motivated inspired by their surroundings and so sometimes it's like where did that art really come from then so in the case of the zeta gundam it's like is the zeta gundam the badass or is camille the badass like you know it's kind of like that sort of thing and and but it's not only that and i feel like if if someone like tamino has that in the back of his mind when he's developing characters that explains a lot with the depth we get out of some characters, even side characters, or even looking at Fa, like how she was almost this backbone that Camille didn't know he had because he he seemed very dismissive of her, but she was like always there with him, always catching up with him and then kind of uh, doing the things that needed to be done in order for Camille to be the man boy that he is. You know what I mean? And yeah. I, I, I think it's interesting to look at that because it made me think about when I'm writing characters. Like, I'm not sometimes considering characters' motivations of who they really are and all their decisions they make could be based on their surroundings. Like, we kind of maybe look at that at a surface level. But how deep can we go with that? Like, to be, you know, again, like, is it the Zeta or is it Camille? You know, and and I like that. I think with like Char, it's funny how with Camille, Tomino uses inspiration from people that exist, even if he doesn't fully encompass everything that person is. He takes ideas. Um, and I think, again, that shows where sometimes great art is about borrowing from elements in life and then kind of using that as a, a lens for what the story is. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Yeah. I mean, you know, it's not even about taking direct inspiration, like you said. It's taking an idea, you know, um, and 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 an interpretation of that, where, you know, Camille Claudel as a person was kind of defined by her relationship to Rodan and to her work. Yeah. And so then, what Tomino is taking out of that is not, you know, I'm going to model. Camille Badan after Camille Claudel, he's modeling Camille Badan off of the relationship that he has to his creation, his sculpture, if you will, the Zeta Gundam. Yeah. And the relationship that he has to his other characters, um, be they romantic relationships, like you said, with Fa, yeah. Quattro, um, you know, m- a, one of more mentorship. So it's interesting. I mean, I think that you've brought up. It, it, it's interesting to me that you brought up the exact same relationship that Claudel had with Rodan being a romantic one and as a mentor in Fa and Quattro, which are relationships yeah. with Camille Badan. And even, you know, talking about the relationships with people, and they talk about it in this interview, how later in the show, in the series, Camille almost has to adopt, I guess, the burden of those that were kind of leading the story. You know what I mean? So it's like, you wonder if Camille as a person, yeah, it just, it's really hard for me to explain what I'm trying to say, but it's giving me greater, even though I love Zeta in the first place, it's giving me even more to appreciate with the writing of the character of Camille. Because even, and I think it's even in this part you might have, have up where they talk about how, yeah, to me, young people today, I'll seem like Camille. So this is 93, 94. Yeah. I would even say even today, young people have that kind of, I think Camille's written as almost that honest type of way we view younger people where yeah. they're kind of entitled, they're, they, but not that they're doing that purposefully. 
but it's almost like the world that they've been given and how sometimes they won't um, uh, recognize the relationships that they have around them or take them for granted. And it's not that they're doing that on purpose. It's just this is the world they're in and how they feel they need to react to it. And within this story where they're even recognizing how Camille is at the beginning, by the end, he becomes a different person because of the relationships he has and how those people are responding. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, and it's funny to hear uh, Anno say this because I made the joke on my Discord uh, a couple weeks ago where I was like, Bright is the character that we all think we associate with, the, the, the character that we see ourselves in, but Camille is mm. the character that we actually are. Yeah. And so it's like funny that. that we kind of fall in that age group that, uh, that yeah. you know, and Anno were criticizing, saying like, yeah, you guys are like Camille. Um, yeah. And, uh, yeah, we, oh, so th this this story in particular from, from this line is, uh, well, actually, before I move on to that line, uh, I want to keep you uh, sort of touching on that thought because uh, Tomino, to me, and I think that this interview kind of confirms this idea for me, is that he writes characters as people really are, yeah. as opposed to these kind of romanticized ideals of what they should be. And so, it can be frustrating for viewers because they see a character like Camille and they're like, why is he so spastic? Why is he, you know, lashing out at everyone around him? He's so annoying. Like, I, I can't yeah. stand, like, it, the, generally speaking, everyone's first reaction from Zeta Gundam is like, I can't stand Camille. He's such a whiny main character. Like, he's, he's terrible. It's like, it's because he's not ideal hero that you would expect to see and i think you even get that with Tomaro. um yeah in the nhk documentary they they they, they explicitly state that when um yoshikazu yasuhiko was designing Tomaro's physical appearance that they didn't want him to be this like buff heroic guy they wanted him to be meek and nerdy and have a terrible haircut and <laughs> you know they wanted him to be a, a real person as opposed to being this uh idealized form like a like a he-man right. that we can you know aspire to be and so i think that that's kind of the the, the key takeaway from from that idea is that homino writes characters as they are not as the audience wants them to be and that's interesting and i don't know if you were going to go here so cut me off no no but that's in contrast to what they talk about later on with victory gundam which right. is interesting how it so in this they talk about Uso as being the ideal child. Yeah. And so is that because Tomino has made so many series that at one point he wants to be able to write that? You know, or could it be with age where for him it, it it's it's a little more interesting now that he's gone through having children, what it, it what the ideal child would be like, you know. I find that interesting. Like, where is he pulling that from? Yeah, yeah. So in the question that you mentioned, um, Anno says, like, oh, yeah, the protagonist of Victory Gundam is depicted as a very sincere child. Has there been a change in your view of young people? And Tomino says something interesting. He's like, well, it doesn't seem that different, does it? I think this, whenever I make something, I don't want to be pulled along by the times. Now that I've become an adult who has finished with with raising children, I thought I'd depict the image of my ideal child the way I'd like children to be. Um, which, is, if, if I were Tomino's child, Kids, I'd probably be, like be a little, a little like, that, uh, hey, wait a second, that seems like uh, kind of a dig. But no, um, I, I get what he's saying, because it's almost like the Amaro not being a superhero, but okay, let's take a child, but without it being a full-on superhero or the idea image, let's just make this the ideal of that slice of a, of a type of character, yeah. which is kind of, I guess, a good... Also, we were talking about contrast. It's a good contrast to the story in Victory Gundam because it's pretty bleak. Right. Uso is probably the main positive, him in the relationship with um, the girl... Oh, why am I... For, Shakti? Right. No. No, uh... that's... The Jedi from um, <laughs> yeah, I was gonna say, wait, prequels. What's the name of that? Anyway, there's that girl that he has a relationship, which I think is one of the most endearing relationships. In, She's in... the one that's having a baby, right? 
Is she? Yes, yeah, she might be. Because he has to feel her stomach. Yeah, that. Oh man, I gotta watch that again. I and again, I think this kind of points to it. What I'm seeing, especially with Anno's responses here, is that th- uh, I was right. Uh, is it Shakti? And is that the same name? I don't know. I gotta look at that. But just the idea of like you know people kind of disregard victory gundam but i think it's because of when it came out and that it never got a dub i always think right. that's the main things but that's we the, see someone like ano a prolific artist that is appreciating victory mm-hmm. and i i gotta say i mean victory is great um, and it was topical at this time because you know that's the it, it was airing at the time so they, you know what Oh, yeah, that's true. It, it's one of those things, too, where sometimes you can look back at something and be like, was it really that great? But I, I got to say, yes, Shock T is the name not only of Star his Wars childhood Wars. friend, but also the Jedi in Star Wars. Wow. I wonder if he did that on purpose, George Lucas. Wow, that would be an interesting nod because you and I have talked a lot about how Lucas and Tamino kind of inspire one another. Yeah, all the time. It seems like it. Um, um now yeah, I do true. want to touch on this story that Tomino mentions when he's talking about uh the children of today. And he says, uh, you know, my apologies for making the rather confusing example, but to me, convenience store onigiri does not taste like onigiri. But children today mm-hmm. say that they are delicious. Even the sense of taste, which seems immutable, has changed completely between thirty years ago and today. In the same way, Things that once felt abnormal have crept into our sense of the ordinary. I don't know if that's good or bad. I love the uncertainty that uh, that he leaves that off with, where it's like, he's like, I'm not judging and saying right. that the children are wrong in their in the fact that their tastes are different than ours, but it it is interesting, right? Like, uh, uh, yeah, I love an, an artist saying something like this yeah, because it's, it's almost like they're open minded. Yeah, to interpretation of how we view things in the world and how, and I always talk about this, like how as generations progress, there are things that are no longer going to be relevant and new things that are more interesting because people are introduced to concepts in different ways. And I think a a good relatable aspect of this is how anime is drawn. I, it's easier for me to stomach older anime than newer anime um, when it's like newer anime that's like highly stylized or something like that, or I would say like the 2000s style anime or whatever, but um, like watching Hathaway to me, that looks like excellent animation, yeah. Um, and while animation from the 80s or like Gunbuster looks old to me, that looks very refined, yeah. Uh, I, I don't know how to explain it, and and it, but that's the thing, you you have uh, younger generations growing up with newer anime. And I'm like, oh, why? Or like mobile gaming. You get kids that are growing up in mobile gaming, and then, oh, that's the new way to do gaming. And it's like, what? But that's just as much a game for them as old games were games for me. You know, it's it's, so it's interesting to see how open he is to that concept where he doesn't allow that to be a barrier for his art. Yeah, Right, because he's going to present the concept as he sees it. And, of course, the interpretation is on the audience. And, you know, it's... This is something that is so quintessential to the Gundam fandom in general because obviously we have these types of debates about taste all the time, right? You know, how can you possibly like IBO? How can you possibly like A Witch from Mercury? Like, go back and watch the originals. And it's like, there's this, there's this strange generational gap that seems to, it seems to transcend any kind of um, exterior stimuli. Like, you can't, can't say right. you can't pinpoint exactly what it is that makes one generation appreciate something in one way and another generation appreciate something in a completely different way and so for tomino to be addressing that idea in 1994 before seed had come out before ivo came yeah. out before all of these like you know kind of hotly debated gundam series had come out it's of interesting and and Tomino himself you know famously doesn't like Gumpla fans right yeah but you know it, in that same way it's it's like well it's just it's just people have different tastes right and like you can't 
Yeah, it, and it's interesting too because by what he's saying, and then I think about nowadays where that stuff still occurs, but I feel like there's going to be some sort of critical mass that occurs because of the internet and because of people being connected that sometimes someone's first exposure to a concept might be of something older. It's just, it's very easy to, and it could be as simple as someone that's younger getting onto the internet follows an influencer that's older that happens to like an old movie they saw when they were a kid. So then that young kid is now being exposed to this older movie that might then make up their mind on how they enjoy a concept of something so that, as the newer things come out, they could be like, yeah, that's cool, but I enjoy the old one. So then it makes me wonder if that is going to be a filter in the future where everyone has access to everything at any time in their life. But what's going to filter through is the stuff that's genuinely timeless or genuinely has integrity behind the art. You know, yeah. I think about that, but honestly, I wonder if there is integrity even in art that we consider, you know, to be not art. Um, a famous example, I guess, that I'm I that comes to mind immediately just because I've been watching, uh, judge me if you will, but I've been watching yeah. old scenes from RoboCop and RoboCop 2 for some reason. Oh. Um, Excellent. Excellent movie. Yeah. You know, RoboCop 2 famously, critically uh, taken apart. There's ter terrible, terrible reception at the time, right? Yeah. But what's fascinating about it is that uh, it became popular again in 2013 because it accurately predicted that the city of Detroit was going to file for bankruptcy. So for those of you who don't oh, know, RoboCop yeah. 2 is about this corporation that is trying to get Detroit to bankrupt itself so that they can acquire the city and like turn it into a privatized zone. And so it's hilarious that this cheesy, you know, bad uh, stop motion animation, I mean, it, it's decent stop motion animation, yeah. but you know, it's it's just action flick, shoot 'em up. Uh, it, it's fascinating that something like that still has cultural relevance because it somehow taps into something that they knew was going to happen. And what's interesting about RoboCop Two is that it was made as just a direct, not only a direct sequel to RoboCop, but they hired the director of Empire Strikes Back to direct it, and. Go. And I think that guy understands like how to make something relevant that might like when you make a sequel to any movie, it's like, OK, what are you really going to do? And it's not right. like he provided new ideas, but it's almost like he doubled down on the ideas of RoboCop. So I think if, in your example, I think that's why something will then make sense in the future. Contrast it with age old, you know, uh, uh effects special effects so like yeah the the stop motion for the uh oh and i forget the name of that robot uh that they had for the sequel um it, it would be neat not saying that they should i'm kind of a fan of this but i know a lot of people aren't it would be neat if they made a remastered version and made cgi on top of all the stop motion i know a lot of people don't like that but like I, when this the special editions for star wars came out you know i wasn't on the internet reading up about Star Wars, seeing what people hated. So when they came right. out with a special edition, I was like, that's amazing that they'd go back to an old movie and add updated effects. I still think it's awesome, even though people don't like it. I, there's some decisions they made that I wouldn't have done, but who am I to say I'm happy that something old is, you know, again, you can watch the old one still if you want to. Right. And they you still can watch exist. Yeah. And so, I, yeah, I think RoboCop is a good example and yeah, I think Talos was saying something about that game uh, that came out. And I meant to record a video for my channel. I might do it later on my gaming channel. But I played the Rogue, uh, was it something Rogue City, RoboCop? I don't know. It's actually really good. It plays yeah. like a RoboCop movie. That's and yeah, ex exactly. And I think I'll talk about it more this Friday, but um, because I don't want to get off topic here. But now, was that I, based on like the 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 eighty seven movie, or was that based off of like the remake, the twenty fourteen? No, it's based on. It's like a sequel to the second one. Oh, that's awesome. Yeah, I mean it. It start. It has the whole story. It has the nuke um drugs in it, and um, it has the same uh the guy that did the voice. Uh, oh yeah, Peter Weller. Yeah, and I don't know if it's the same girl that does the voice, but it's the same character. Annie Lewis, I think was her name, the the girl cop he was with. Um, but yeah, I think 
I think you pulled up a good example of artists, Paul Verhoeven, Irvin Kirshner, yep. that know what they're doing with their properties, um, just like right. Tomina. Yeah, I mean, and, and it just goes to show that even something that that you might disregard as, you know, fluff or, um, you know, you don't know what is going to be culturally, culturally relevant 30 years yeah. from now. And even Tomino himself is kind of admitting to that here, yeah. um, which is fascinating for somebody that, you know, we are still looking at work that he did 45 years ago and talking about it, right? Yes, that I think that speaks for itself. Wow, yeah. Um, here's a an excellent question from uh, Anna. Wow, Victory Gundam is good. Uh, <laughs> to which Tomino replies to me, "Any consideration of serious matters through my works ended with Zeta Gundam. The reason I made Char's counterattack was because when Zeta Gundam, when the Zeta Gundam plan was decided, I realized from here on." I'll probably have to do two or three series before I can settle things between Shar and Amaro. That's why I withdrew Shar in the middle of Zeta Gundam. I don't know about withdrew in the middle of Zeta Gundam, but yes, he did kind of have Shar take a back seat. You know, yeah. the, the first sort of main character that you see in Zeta Gundam is Shar infiltrating yeah. um, Green Noah. So I think that there was obviously an intent at the beginning to have Shar be the main character. And I've talked about this before in the pitch notes. Uh, Tomino said that like the the series was supposed to end with Shirako killing Char. So, um, yeah, obviously, you know, Camille then became the main character uh, as a result of that. You, you know, that's very interesting because I, I feel like with what Tomino is saying, he he himself, without having to try, is very honest with his art. Yeah. And I think, though, he knows he's in that corporate machine, so it's like, yeah, people want Sharon Amaro. And he's all like, well, I'm done with that character. I said what I wanted to say. And so that kind of helps me get a better understanding of Char's counterattack and Double Zeta. Oh, yeah. Like, you could tell by Double Zeta, Tomino wants to kind of do something different. Right, and, and he it contextualizes to... all of those, yeah. all of those Char... decisions. And Char's counterattack is almost like, uh, well, yeah, here's a movie, a quick movie, where we can just settle Amaro and Char. And We're he even does it without, if you think about it, you can't confirm by the end that they're dead or alive. Yeah. It, sure. Like, so it's like, okay, people want these characters. Let me do this. And I, I, in a way it's handled well because it, there's no confirmation. Yeah. It, which is kind of, a, you know, that's Tomino style, right? Like yeah. he's not willing to say whether or not uh, cultural change is good or bad. Um, now, what yeah. do you think of this line where he says, any consideration of serious matters through my works ended with Zeta Gundam? And I think that's part of what I was saying, too, because, like, with Zeta Gundam, he's like, okay, people still want, you know, Char, but I really want to do my own thing. So I'm not going to take it serious in terms of that kind of corporate rollout of the IP. Yeah. He's he's just going to do what he wants to do, which I think is what happened with Double Zeta, because he kind of made it that more like group of kids, you know, it was a little goofy at the beginning. And then again, Char's counterattack. And then even by victory Gundam, it's tonally similar, but there's some very different types of characters. And then even go as far as that bikini squad. Right. I, so I think it's him channeling into more of what he wants to do as a creator rather than giving someone Sharver's armor. part four. Yeah. Yeah. I, I mean, it's, he definitely kind of turned his attention towards telling stories that that I think he more wanted to tell. Um, I, yeah, just uh, it, it's very interesting to me that, that that's... I think that if he had chosen to, he would have kind of ended the story of Gundam with Zeta Gundam. And, you know... Well, oh, oh sorry. Even in this interview, it sounded like he was done with Gundam. Because when he was making that follow-up, I, I think it was Elgheim or one of the ones you mentioned, he he was like, well, maybe I should start writing what the next Gundam would be. Right. I, it's I it's almost like he, he's like, I have to do another one of these, you know, and almost like as a creator, he's like, okay, this art is very uh, passionately loved. And maybe that motivated him to do because there's so many one-shot animes he has 
you yeah. know, where they're just like a series and that's it. But this, he did that follow on. It, it, but it was almost like we always say how like Zeta Gundam is like the ultimate vision yeah. because it's Gundam. He had no constraints. He, he saw it in my ultimate ultimate vision. It's not about Char. Right. He's just a, a component of this world. And, and I yeah. think you said it is, you know, if it were truly up to Tomino and I'm speculating here, then he would have preferred to continue doing sort of these one off single series animes that had nothing to do with Gundam. But as a result of utilizing the franchise and utilizing the sort of the corporate machine money that that he was getting with Gundam, he was able to kind of um, parlay that into the opportunity to tell stories like Victory Gundam, to tell stories like Turn A Gundam while still making them commercially viable by using the Gundam franchise as a vehicle to tell those stories without necessarily riding on the coattails of the Shar Amaro drama, right? Yeah. Is that kind of the, uh, the suggestion that you're making? Yeah, yeah, that is. And I think that's interesting because it, it, I think again and again, and this interview really shows it, is where Tomino is really attached to his vision and what, and what he is trying to portray, like, artistically. Now, with that, and uh, on the subject of portrayal, here we finally get into the hotly debated subject of uh, Camille's autism, um, which, you know, so I'm just going to go ahead and read this so that we can kind of uh, just get our context and then we can unpack it because this is probably the only time that we hear Homino directly address Camille's portrayal as an autistic character. Ano asks... At the time, I couldn't understand the protagonist Camille at all, like many of us. Looking mm -hmm. at it again, I vaguely understood him, saying, oh, even though he's the protagonist, this person is in the role of a bystander. And what's more, you also have Shirako watching from the sidelines, Char playing the part of Lieutenant Quattro, and Amaro ashamed of being pathetic for seven years. They're all in a state of confusion. And meanwhile, Amaro and Char are, see their own past selves in Camille. We often see depictions of the same mistakes being repeated. So were you trying to say we can't help repeating our folly? To which Tamina replies, That wasn't clearly articulated, so those depictions aren't well organized and appear confusing. I'd like to say they actually have this kind of hidden meaning, so you should think of them this way. But I'd be lying. As for Camille, that's correct in terms of his initial setting. But I had a problem. I didn't really understand the process of becoming autistic in which introspective problems are repeatedly presented in the mind. When I was depicting Camille, I couldn't follow that psychological process because I was trying to depict him by including characters who never should have entered the dramatic space, such as Char and Amaro. As a dramatist, I didn't understand the process of becoming autistic, and that's another reason he's hard to understand. I'm a TV creator, after all, so the artist's way of making things suits me better, and I think I'm good at it. To me, Camille Badan was certainly a character who car carried a heavy burden. So what's your sort of first interpretation and takeaway from that, Adam? Um, well, I like the, the line, they actually have this kind of hidden meaning, so you should think of them this way. But I'd be lying. Right. So I, I, I think he's almost like saying how, you know, people are like, oh, this is what he's trying to say. And then Tomino at, at some level appreciates that people like to – say oh this is what he was trying to say but right. he wasn't yeah and then i guess and i could be wrong you might need to help me with some of this but it also seems like he's also trying to say especially with the autistic quote is more of he really he's trying to figure out how to write these characters as they go yeah and i guess he says i didn't really understand the process of becoming autistic which i i think part of this has to do with probably translation how we see the term autistic versus maybe in japan but sure. it seemed like maybe in this this is more of a state of mind and not like a clinical diagnosis yeah there could be some of that involved for sure and um and tomino is nothing if not honest and and i think we yeah. kind of touched on that earlier the idea that his portrayal of characters is honest it's not kind of riddled with artistic fancy which is yeah. ironic because to me the way that i read this is he it's kind of like a method actor, you know, 
um, when you think of like Heath Ledger locking himself in mm. a hotel room and becoming the Joker, I think that that is what Tomino's talking about when he's like, I didn't really understand the process of becoming autistic. I, I think that, you know, A, that, like you said, there's the interpretation that that could be a translation issue. Um, th there's a misunderstanding there. Or there's the sort of artistic interpretation to suggest, like, I couldn't put myself in that headspace. And so I didn't have the tools, like the, the artistic tool set in order to represent Camille in the way that I intended to. Mm -hmm. I don't know. what What's. Yeah, I, I don't know. Um it's it's one of those things where I don't like to default and say that, like, I, I don't know. It's it's kind of like the line he was saying where, you know, there's these hidden meanings, you know. I, I, I don't know. Unless something is spelled out and that's a part of the character, I don't like to assume something. Right. Um, although, you know, to be honest, I like the idea of um, – neurodivergent characters i just don't think they're always used effectively like i think with the like the predator movie that came out uh not the last one the one before they used an autistic kid that was able to interface with the predator helmet i felt like that was so surface level and i thought okay i there yeah. could have been a better way to do that i think um, they did that uh that same gimmick in mass effect like the dlc for mass effect oh 2, really yeah uh, I never project overlord that. Oh, okay. Yeah, there's the uh, there's the famous quote from the evil scientist older brother that's like, oh, well, David's autistic mind is capable of interfacing with the Geth neural network, and um, yeah, yeah, and but but also I think that if people saying they don't like the Camille character and they're like, oh, well, he was autistic, I think that's almost like a bad thing in a way because it's almost like yeah. you're trying to explain dislikes by attributing it to a class of people. And one that seems kind of mean, but at, uh, <laughs> a little bit. At, at the same time, it's like, oh, the reason we don't like this character is because he was written as an autistic person, mm -hmm. which I don't think there's necessarily any confirmation that that was Tomino's intention. And I think so. Tomino himself, kind of towards the end of this, uh, towards the end of this line, is kind of suggesting like that he probably didn't represent him in the best possible light uh, for a character that either is neurodivergent yeah. or not regardless of of his uh of his status yeah he probably feels like he regrets a little bit um you know how the character was portrayed and that last line where he says he was certainly a character who carried a heavy burden you know there's the sort of in-universe explanation of that like yes Camille Badan suffered from like a lot of responsibility being heaped on him but I think mm -hmm. that also in the sort of real life interpretation of Camille Badan as a character I think that he carried a heavy burden of being you know a disliked protagonist I think you could say the same about like mm -hmm. Raiden from Metal Gear Solid 2 you know, the character of Raiden carried a heavy burden in the fact that people were expecting to go into Metal Gear Solid 2 playing a solid snake. Oh. And then all of a sudden you're playing as this effeminate, uh, you know, younger, not as tough, not as cool character. And so it's like that character suffers the heavy burden of having like all these expectations thrust upon them and then being and then falling short of them. And in that yeah. same way, I think that that's kind of, in, again, this is kind of up to interpretation. I think that Tomino's suggesting that Mio Badan as a character has that heavy burden placed upon him by the fans where it's like he just didn't live up to their their expectations or their wants. And, and that's interesting because I think in general, the way new types are written in UC Gundam are kind of similar like that, where a lot of times they're awkward or it's like, what is with this character? And I think, again, to like assume, oh, it's because they're autistic and completely looking past the new type. Because I think, and this is neat to me, I mean, the neurodivergent sort of thing can occur in what we diagnose someone as being autistic. Or if someone's a new type, it could be that the brain works in very similar ways when it comes to um, emotions, expressing yourself, your relationships with other people. Um, yeah. So I think there's a neat parallel there. Um, and I'm yeah. glad that you brought that up because um, Anno follows up that question talking about the character of four 
oh, which yeah. he says worked very well. Where did she originate from? And Tamino says, well, she's linked to Camille's ongoing story. I wanted to depict Camille as simply as four as just an autistic kid. I only have sensory recollection of four now, but I really liked her. There's one thing that I realize now, though. After I made four, Camille didn't work anymore. I remember that he was absorbed by her. Now, for a guy that typically is kind of literal and direct in his um, in his statements about things, this is a very um, sort of vague way of putting things. Like, how? what does he mean that Camille was absorbed by four? Yeah, my first thought was him saying after he wrote four and had Camille meet her, I feel like there's almost some essence of him. He's having to go through Camille and he himself fell in love with the character of four and realized, well, where else would I be able to go with the story now that I've created this kind of character for Camille? As we were speaking about earlier, how a lot of, I think, character motivations, we don't realize how much it's based on someone else or any like the artist, the original Camille, you yeah. know? And so I wonder if for Tomino, that's what was going on. He created this four that kind of changed how Camille would be. And then he realized I can't do that, you know, or we have to kill her off or like, know, yeah, how do we, how do we dial it back? And <laughs> yeah. I mean, there, there's definitely a, a conversation to be had, I think about characters that exist solely for the pathos of another character. Right. You know, there's the, like, uh, there's the girl in the fridge TV trope where, um, you know, there was the Green Lantern who he had a girlfriend, but the only reason that she existed, she didn't really have any character besides the fact that a supervillain killed her and folded her up and put her in a fridge. Um, and it oh, was man. supposed to be this big character building moment for the Green Lantern, but it's like, could you have done that with like a char a real character and not, you know, just yeah, that's, throw away character? That's pretty dark. Yeah, very dark. Um, yeah. <laughs> it was, you know, early 2000s comic books. They were pretty violent. Ah, okay. Um, but it, it, I don't think that 4 falls into that mold, obviously, because Tomino himself suggests that 4 is a much more richly developed character than even Camille, sort of, yeah. in, this, uh, in this interpretation. So... I don't know, it, it, and I think that you you run into a lot of characters like that in Zeta Gundam. I know that Rekoa and Emma are other examples that people typically will bring up, where it's like, where where is their motivation? Why why do they not seem to have any agency of their own? Um, but I think that if you dig a little bit deeper, you see that they are really a lot more fleshed out than you give them credit for. And I almost feel like that's kind of the basis of a lot of maybe Tomino storytelling is having these different types of characters meet. And that almost kind of ignites like the uh, exposition or the storytelling of their character. I mean, even Sarah is a good example because I remember when they yeah. first introduced Sarah, she just seemed like a side character, but then it built based on the other interactions of other characters, you know? Um, and it's almost like, it's almost like Tomino is having that dialogue, inner dialogue, but between two fictional characters of like, why are you doing this? Oh, it's because of this. And it's like, but you could do this. And it's like, yeah, but this. And it's like, oh, okay. It kind of reminds me of um, uh, Darth Helmet from uh, Baseballs playing baseballs? with his. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Playing yeah, with that's... the balls. But <laughs> I mean, isn't that yeah. what all kind of creators do is it's basically you're kind of exploring these ideas and you know, you kind of have this inner dialogue going on where maybe you're playing devil's advocate against yourself. Yeah. And so to be able to externalize that as two individual characters with their own motivations and their own stories is kind of the quintessential gift of a writer, right? Yeah. Oh, yeah, definitely. Yeah. Um. Now, we'll close out here with, you know, this last bit where Ano says, once Haman and Shirako show up, Camille is carrying four people's burdens from episode 20 onwards. Mm. Camille suddenly becomes very busy. Um, Tomino replies, well, that's something I didn't, that I hadn't expected. I'm very sorry about that. I guess we can understand why in the final episode, he feels like he's taking a little rest. Mm. Yeah, that's interesting. Mm. It's almost like, unless Tomino's tongue, tongue in cheek, it's almost like he is explaining the way he, he, he engages his storytelling is he lets it unfold naturally yeah which i want to say uh, I, I wonder how much that is a thing in, in 
with creation in general? Like, was it JoJo's Bizarre Adventure manga or something where it was more like they just kept going and going and going, you know, just drawing whatever, naming things whatever, just and then making yeah. it up as they go? And sometimes that works. Like, at what level are you making things up? Like, is it the whole world? Or for Tomino's sake, maybe the whole world was established. And maybe he was making up the unfolding of the characters. And that's why there's that disconnect sometimes of Char's motivation. Because as yeah. things were unfolding, he's like, no, I'm going to do this instead. And, or, you know, change things up. I don't know. Yeah, and I think that it's probably, um, you know, this is my sort of opinion, that it, it was probably the worst thing that could have happened Char's counterattack being greenlit because what would Tomino have done with Char to round out that character at the end of Zeta Gundam had he not kind of been on the hook, to, so to speak? Like, well, I got to keep him around so that I can deliver on this movie that people are expecting. Um, yeah. You know, uh, it's very it reminds me of like Boba Fett being used in Star Wars. Yeah, You know how he was just kind of a background character, but people loved him so much that in the special edition, which I think it was the first time, they just added it in more. Right. And then from there, we now get this book of Boba Fett movie, which I think w what happened there is Disney recognized there's something people like, but didn't recognize why. Yeah. So they're just like, well, let's just make a Boba Fett show. But it's like, why is it that people liked it? And part of it was the mystery. Even Timur Morrison, the actor, even said he's talking too much in this. Yeah. In, in the show. And and it's interesting because I think then I wonder with, with the Japanese creation of Gundam and all that, did the studio, even though they want Tomino to do certain things, they still give him the freedom of how it's done in order to kind of keep that essence? Because even if Char is different by Char's counterattack, He's still similar to the original Char we met. Oh yeah, he just kind of went through his midlife crisis in Zeta, <laughs> but it's it's it, there still seems to be some genuine honesty with the way the characters are written. Definitely, you know, even if they're forced. Yeah, you know what I mean. Yeah, yeah, you know, um, you and this is typically something that I criticize in in stories. You know, the idea of like the plot driving the characters as opposed to the characters driving the plot. But Tomino has a very authentic way, I think, of delivering characters where they need to be in order to satisfy all our, all parties involved, um, whether they're in universe or in real life. And and that's yeah. where you get something like Char's Counterattack, which is so well executed. Um, and it's what the people wanted. It just, yeah. you know, like you said, it, uh, it feels like there was maybe something he wanted to say more. Right. And... Um, yeah, Shark's Counterattack is definitely one of those where that is definitely the Gundam that people would want. Oh, yeah. But then for me, it's like I see that and feel like, okay, missed opportunity. Sure. But but you, you can't take away what it can do to make something that people want. Because even getting into Gundam, the, the first things that I would always see is how Shark's Counterattack is the best. Yeah. People and, and, love and Shark's Counterattack. It, and, I mean, it's fantastic. It it really is good, and as a Gundam fan, like it it feels satisfying to. But and maybe this is another <clears throat> place we divert. I think it's just okay. But the good thing about it is that it's a movie. So right. like, I, and because it's constant action, I will watch it often. Yeah, because it's easy in to an digest. hour and a half. It's... I can get some awesome Gundam action. Uh, yeah, I think as a standalone film it is perfect but in the context of the greater un Gundam universe you know there's so many unanswered questions and so many um things that we would have liked to see fleshed out a little bit more um, you know what especially considering when Gundam they realized it's popular then they made the movie trilogy right how many people cared to watch 50 episode shows I wonder how large the gap is of people that are just oh I watched the movie trilogy then I saw Char's Counterattack and they didn't really sit around to watch, you know, 40 whatever episodes of Zeta. Right. Because this double was prior Zeta. to um this is prior to the Zeta new translation trilogy. So yeah. they wouldn't have considered doing that. And yeah, is the movie audience in Japan different than the at home watching TV audience? That is definitely a yeah, a good question. Yeah, 
it's almost like a cinematic universe versus a series universe. And they've all, they've all, they've actually done that. The movie trilogy omits things from the series yeah. of both the original and Zeta. And then Charge Counterattack almost omits double Zeta. Yeah, you know? <laughs> it, it, it does feel that way for sure. So that's, that's interesting. I never thought about it that way. That there's almost in animation, you can almost see it as two different continuities. Yeah. Two Cinema timelines. Series. Yeah. Well, that'll be something that we have to explore another time. Yeah, I think so. But uh, but yeah, I, I really appreciate this interview, and I hope you guys have enjoyed looking through it. For me, it was very, it was important for Tomino himself, in his own words, to kind of contextualize the character of Camille, not just as a neurodivergent character, but, you know, you see him talking about, like, kind of where he fits into the Gundam mythos, right? Yeah. Um, and that seems to be the the primary subject of this of this interview is strictly on Camille, his inspiration, where he uh, how he operates as a character, how he operates in relationship to other characters. And of course, you know. How he takes on the role of both Amaro and Char by the end of the series, like he becomes he becomes all of these different characters and just becomes a vessel for. Um, yeah. For everyone, which is kind of poetic because his body then becomes the vessel by which yeah. Shirako is killed. Yeah. And in fact, it's just his mind then that is used in Double Zeta to help Judo move forward. Exactly. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I like that. Well, good, good deal. Stuff. Yeah. Sorry, we're running a little bit over, but, uh, you know, today I think was a, a fun. We, we definitely needed to get into some of the, the nitty gritty on this interview. And yes. so I appreciate you guys sticking sticking with us for it. Again, oh, the yeah. link to the full transcriptions in the description below, so you guys can check it out for yourself. Um, and let's all go take a look at Adam's breakdown of Operation oh. Odessa after yeah. the stream ends here. Uh, don't forget to check out the Gundam Explained show tomorrow at eleven uh, Central, noon yep. Eastern. Am I forgetting anything, Adam? No, I think that's it. Man, this was a yeah. packed good episode i think uh a good sh live show uh, yeah. yeah yeah i apologize for the audio issues i'll i'll try to clean those up and uh again apologies for my voice and coughing frequently but um you know the show must go on is what they yeah, say oh yeah oh yeah <laughs> so th this topic was too important to just put off till next week definitely but yeah, yeah gotta suffer through it <laughs> yeah exactly if, if i have to deal with it you guys are going to deal with it um so yeah, thank you guys so much for hanging out with us and I will catch you all later. See ya.